Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Vineyard of Hope in Osawatomie, Kansas. My prayer for you today is that God would touch your heart in a real and tangible way for a breakthrough in your life as you hear this message. Thank you for watching, and I want to give you a personal invitation to come and see what we're all about. The church information is at the end of this video. Now I hope you enjoy this message. God bless. God is so good. I have a friend. He's a brother in Christ, and I will never forget uh, the way we met was social media, and he, he saw some stuff one year, and he said, I've got to meet you. And he's become a brother in Christ, Pastor Steve Slate. He came here one time to, to, um, to preach. And so you might know him, the guy with the Santa Claus beard. Him and Sharon Slate came, and this man is huge to my heart. He prays for our church. He has for the last six years. He prays for me. He played for a whole year uh, for me and my wife before we even knew him. And said, i got to meet you. And I met him at district council when we all went one year, and and I want to share something he shared with me the other day and with a lot of people, actually. Would you play that, please? Thank you. Good morning. I uh, have some things I want to share with you. Sorry. Getting in the car. Going to do it on the way to work. It's the only time i got time right now. Uh, first of all, thank you, Papa. We invite you. We invite you, Jesus. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Uh, come and work in our hearts and minds what pleases you and help us to hear your voice and help us to respond uh, quickly and correctly, especially correctly. <laughs> oh, we love you, Papa. We love you, Jesus. We praise your name. You are good and what you do is good. So I woke up this morning. What was it? 3.30? Between 3 and 3.30 in the morning. And this song, a phrase from a Christmas song, was stuck in my mind. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. And it was, I won't say annoying, persistent. Uh, enough that it began to dawn on me. I was trying to convince myself to go back to sleep and then I asked the Lord I said Holy Spirit what do you have to say about this and I don't know how to explain sometimes what he speaks to you comes in thoughts and they come quickly quicker than trying to articulate it and to speak it and I knew that I'm not to focus on the weather outside, uh, not the literal weather, but what's going on outside. Inside, the fire is delightful. Inside, at home, with Papa, with Jesus, with God, uh, with Holy Spirit, mm, it's delightful and it's warm and it's protected and what I heard him say was focus and I knew okay this is a reminder to focus on what God is doing rather than what it seems he is not doing sometimes it is a mystery when we're praying and believing and we don't see uh, things happening in our time or in our way like we know it's the will of God uh, we know that's his heart, his plan, but we don't see it yet. So rather than focus on what it appears God is not doing, he was reminding me to focus on what he is doing. So I began to uh, consider all the things that I uh, am aware of that God's doing, that he's blessing, that he's pleased with, that he has pleasure over. Uh, the things that are going well, the things that s some people are speaking over us and into us and affirmation and encouragement. I thought, yes, Papa. I'm going to focus on that uh, more than the weather outside. Actually, he told me not to focus on the weather outside. <laughs> so I want to I wanna encourage you to do that. In your own life what what is God blessing in your life what do you sense his pleasure on what is he pleased with 
what do you walk in his blessing on or in? I am certain there are things in your life that you have the favor and the blessing of God that maybe you take for granted or don't even realize. Think about that. Focus on that. And the affirmations that come to you, know that they are whispered by God himself through people that appreciate and that are thankful. Those are awesome. Uh, Major on that and focus on that rather than the negative stuff. Uh, And by negative stuff, I mean detrimental things that people say. Or you might even be tempted to say of yourself, like, I'll never get it right. It will never change. Quit that. Stop that. Tell yourself to stop it. Tell your mind, okay, stop that. And focus back on God's promise. That's another one. The things that God has uh, caught your attention with, uh, that he's put a spotlight on in the promises of God in your life. Uh, Maybe even times when pastors preaching and the Holy Spirit puts a spotlight on something that he said, grab a hold of that. Write it down. Take it to heart. That's another thing. Write those things down. Uh, make a notebook. Make a note in the back of your Bible in, uh, or pieces of paper. Put it up on the mirror. Somewhere where you will refer to it time and time again and let that work into the fiber of your being and become part of what defines you and of who you are. One of the ones that uh, set the course for my life years and years, decades ago now, I will always have hope and I will praise you more and more. And some of the most important times that I have grabbed a hold of that and declared it is when I had no hope. I was looking around, and that's how I felt. It's not true, I know, but I felt like I had no hope. And I sure didn't want to praise because I didn't feel like it. But I had a word. I had a promise. God had seen the head and seen my future, and he had spoken that over me and quickened it to my heart and to my spirit by the Holy Spirit. He had done that. And I responded correctly. I grabbed a hold of that and I began to say that and write it and write it again in different places and and get it to where it was a part of my being because God had seen my future and he was calling me to that, that I would always have hope and I will praise him more and more and more. See, the Lord's whispering things to you. He has in the past And he is now. He's always speaking. He loves to communicate. And remember the guidelines in Corinthians for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to build, to encourage, to strengthen. Not to tear down, not to release judgment. Remember the disciples one time, they said, Jesus, we went over there to prepare the way for you to come over there, and they didn't want you. Should we call down fire like Elijah? Jesus said, Mm, boys, you don't even know what spirit you're operating in when you do that. He was saying, that's not my spirit. That's something that happened in the Old Testament under the law. Don't try to take that and apply it here in the New Testament under grace. That's not why I'm here. Yeah, I know some of you may not like that. I just want to encourage you to keep looking at Jesus. He is good theology. Jesus, he's a good example. His footsteps are trustworthy. We can follow in them. Love you all so much. I uh, love you all so much. This is the day he's made. We will rejoice and be glad in him. Oh, Papa, we love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Weather outside is frightful. So we're going to focus on the fellowship around the fire. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the fire of your presence, the fire of your love. Oh, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Amen. (laughs) Ah, isn't that good? How many of you guys uh, can see why I like this guy so much? (laughs) 
He's like the grandpa that never goes away. You sit there, you can soak under him and in, in his words. But uh, I am so, I am so grateful for him in my life. I would finished uh, my sermon for this week. And, and uh, right when I did that, let me turn this off. You can turn some music up back there, Brian, please. Um, I guess I didn't charge you enough. But um, I finalized my sermon and Steve Slate sent this to me. And I finalized my sermon, and this was such confirmation and affirmation that I was going in the right direction. Uh, and then Saturday, we're in here, and I erased my whole sermon by accident. And so I was up till 2 this morning and putting it all back together, but uh, I think it came back together in a better way. And I find it funny that so many distractions come to try to get in the way whenever you're really trying to focus on the Lord. Who would agree, right? It was funny, so I'm trying to focus on this. And then at about 11.30 last night, our neighbors, just a couple of houses down, there was a big rumble going on it was like they were all going to kill each other cussing and yelling at each other so i'm sitting there in my word and all of a sudden i heard the rackets and i'm like oh my gosh and i got bad enough to where i had to call the cops and they did it again at, and then we heard gunshots and uh and so i'm like okay i guess i'm going to bed because it was getting a little hairy we called the cops we made sure that everybody was safe but but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter when or how hard you try often when you're trying to get right where you need to be distractions and chaos come to keep you from your time with god and we've got to learn how to, what he said, focus. We've got to learn how to really put our mind and our heart on what matters while we're in the waiting, while we're waiting for something different in our life, while we're transitioning from one way of life to another, while we're simply doing what we're called to do, and that's simply serving until we see a miracle so that we can be part of somebody else's miracle, then we do it again. We, we wait on the Lord, and we, we go from glory to glory and faith to faith, correct? How many here find that when, <laughs> when chaos is taking place, so when the storms of life are raging, it sometimes feels impossible to see the good in the waiting. Anybody else? It's like, I can't see it. I guess it's not just me. I'm trying, but I just can't see it. Turn with me to Job chapter 1. I'm going to read a, an event here. Just Job chapter 1 is going to tell you a lot about where we're going, and I want you to hear this. In verse 1, it says, There once was a man named Job who lived in a land of he was blameless a man of complete integrity think about that comment that statement complete integrity he feared God and stayed away from evil period he had seven sons and three daughters ten kids that's crazy right he owned seven thousand sheep three thousand camels five hundred teams of oxen and five hundred female donkeys this means he had everything you could ever think of it goes on to say he also had many servants he was in fact, the richest person in the entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes. And they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. Now, when the celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and he would offer a burnt sacrifice. Remember, this is Old Testament. Don't go sacrificing your dogs or anything for your kids. That won't work here. Just saying. He would get up early in the morning, he'd go and he'd offer burnt offerings for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. But this was Job's regular practice because he feared God. He loved God. He was a man of great integrity. That means he concerned himself with their well-being. He concerned himself in love with how they were doing and what was going to happen making sure that if they were going to do that, that he was going to cover them the best he possibly could. It goes on to say, One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. That means the devil came for the party he wasn't invited to. Verse 7 says, Where have you come for? from? The Lord said to Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, said, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. How many of you guys know that? He runs around. The Bible says he comes like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man on all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. Remember that, complete integrity. Isn't that amazing? He fears God and stays away from evil. Now Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything that he does. Look how rich he is. And the devil just good at what he does? He said, but reach out and take away everything he has and he will surely curse, curse you to your face, God. 
And this was God's response. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. How many of you guys know that some tests come because God allows them? I'm going to rephrase that. Let me word that properly. Some tests come because God allows them. All tests come because God allows them. He's God. The Alpha and the Omega, the one who knows the beginning from the end. If he doesn't want it to happen, it will not happen. But there are some things he lets happen in our life, right? To grow, to strengthen. I don't mean that that means he makes bad things happen to us. The enemy does the bad things. All right. You may test him, the Lord said. And he said this to Satan, it says. So do whatever you want with, with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Isn't that crazy? This whole thing, while I'm picturing it in my mind, was was a moment where the enemy was coming in and saying, I'm going to get one on you. I'm going to get one over on you. This guy's only good because you protect him. You've made him rich. He has anything you could ever long for and more. No wonder he's fearful of you and loves you and he does all this. It's because you help him out. He said, all right, you may test him. Then the Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with him. With everything that he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Now one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the older brother's house, the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived to Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Siberian raided us, the Siberians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Now immediately when God said, okay, go ahead, this, this tragedy takes place. And a huge loss hits them right between the eyes. Goes on to say, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with news that said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all of your shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, while that was still happening, while he was still speaking, it says a third messenger arrived with the news that said, three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped you. It just keeps coming. The hits just keep coming. They just keep coming. When you read this, you just see that once he was released and he was allowed to begin to do what he was going to do and test Job, one thing after the other after the other starts taking place immediately. And no longer could one get his breath out or the story of tragedy out than another tragedy was being brought before him. Sound familiar? While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with news. He says, your sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's home. And suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. He goes on to say, the house collapsed and all of your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, Jude, you gotta, Job stood up and he tore his robe in grief. Could you imagine all the loss of his servants, all the loss of his cattle, all the loss of his donkeys, all the loss of these people he loved, his whole family gone and right here. What do you think that Job's going to do? We would expect that he would probably do what a lot of us do because we crumble in the fear and the agony and the pain. We crumble in the tragedy. We fall to pieces when we're supposed to see God putting things in place and bringing them together, but we can't see that because it's too hard to see that when we're in pain, right? But this is what Job does. It's Job stood up and he tore his robe in grief. And then he shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. I mean, this is a great man of constant integrity and faith. Consistent, constant integrity and faith who feared the Lord. He said this. this he, these are his words. These words jack me up every time I read them. But he said, he said, I came naked from my mom's womb, my mother's womb. And I will be naked when I leave because the Lord... The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. He just lost everything, and he rips everything apart, and he gets and he starts to praise God. He says, I didn't have anything coming into the world. I won't have nothing going out, so I'm just going to praise him. It wasn't mine to begin with. I was blessed with this so I could steward this, but, but it doesn't matter what you hit me with, devil. It doesn't matter what you throw at me, devil. I'm going to fear the God that loved me more than I'm going to jump into your trap. And allow the tragedy to consume me. It's not always falling apart. It's falling into place. The whole title of this is. In the waiting. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Sometimes we've got to open our eyes. Amen. Job stood up. Tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head. Fell to the ground to worship. When he just found out his family had all been killed. Hmm. Praise the name of the Lord. At the end of this. The last verse it says. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. 
What does that mean? That means that when we blame God, we are lacking faith that's needed. Thus, we are sinning against the God who gave us all we had anyway. We don't know it till we know it. Now you're made aware, so you understand this. We can't blame God because we put ourselves in a precarious situation. God doesn't call bad things to happen, but he will allow seasons of pain and trauma and waiting and suffering to happen. He allows things to build our endurance, strengthen our faith so that people can see the glory of God on the other end of things. It's how he works, and he's really good at it. Amen? I'm going to try and stick to these notes. In the season of intense war or unrelenting spiritual attacks like Job or gut-wrenching grief and loss, like when Job lost everything, we live often so blinded to the blessings that are really going on around us, and justifiably, for many reasons, we can't see a thing. Have you ever been to that point? Because I've been that way this year a little bit here and there, guys where I know what he's done and I know there are miracles taking place while I'm walking through this life and I know there are issues that, that, that he is remedying and there are miracles that I'm just not seeing because I'm too blinded by the fight. Anybody else been there? I can't be Job. I, Job did this, but I surely wouldn't have acted or reacted this way. I certainly haven't this, this year all the time. But today I want to tackle what I believe are the greatest reasons for not seeing the hope or the victory in the middle of our storm. What do I mean or what does it mean when I say in the middle of our storms? I'm literally talking about, again, while we are in the waiting. I want to talk to you about what it means. Or while we are in the battle and the victory does not seem to be close at all, why is it so hard to see the good taking place during the storm or while we're in the waiting? Why is it so tough? Hear me out, because I really, I really believe that while we fight the many little battles in this overall war taking place around us, many of us miss the little victories won, a.k.a. blessings that we do receive while we're in this war because we haven't gotten through the big war. We miss all the little battles that, are, are victor- that, that we're victorious in. Like the day you didn't give in to the temptation to look at pornography. You're going through all this hell and that temptation comes and you forget to celebrate the fact that you were strong and didn't give in. Or the day that you didn't drive by the liquor store and stop because you were trying not to do that. You, you, you got to celebrate the fact that when the temptation come, you didn't stop. Praise God, the stress was there, but you didn't give up. Do we celebrate those things? Or are we too blinded to see every one of those victories in the overall war because we're too consumed by the battle of the war itself? Why don't we see what we need to see? I, I tell you, there are several reasons. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a reason we don't walk with the God-given authority that we have, church. So there's, there's greatest reason. Uh, let me read this. I wrote this. I said, hear me out, all right? Because I really believe that while we fight the many battles in the overall war taking place around us, many of us miss the little victories won, a.k.a. blessings, while we are in this huge war that is consuming us. So there's a great reason our hope is stolen and, there, and that our strength isn't what we used to have or that we no longer have uh, longevity or power to stand in the fight. There's a reason. There's a reason we do not walk with a God-given authority while we are in the waiting for our breakthrough. So this is what the Holy Spirit simply said to me <laughs> in my own distress and my own frustration, in my own prayers and petition to Abba Father as I'm personally crying out for, for an answer to why I can't seem to see the good in everything that, that is happening around because there are good things taking place too, right? I'm like, God, how come I can't celebrate those? I'm not really taking those in in this big war. All these battles that you won, you're blessing me here, you're blessing me there. My kids still, they're still healthy. My, my relationships are being restored with my family. Why can't I see all this in the big war? While I was doing that personally, while I'm unable to, to really see how great you are, God, and I'm in the waiting for a miracle. Well, well, well all those things you gave me and those people you gave me to lead, well, I see you working in their circumstances. Why can't I see some of the little things I ask him? Anybody ever done that? I guess it's just me. And this is what he said. It was like, boom, boom, with a small, still voice that's louder than all my thoughts together in my mind. I hear him say, open your eyes. It's such a simple statement, but it's not. Open your eyes. It's a simple answer to some, but, but to most, <laughs> we would say, I have had my eyes open, God. Come on. I've been looking, I've been watching, I've been going to church, I've been reading my... Have you? Or have you stopped? Have you waned? Have you pulled back from the relationship that kept you able to see the things that you needed to see when the battle got rough? Sometimes we separate ourselves from the disciplines that keep us seeing God in all things, and so we wonder why we don't see God in anything anymore. 
It's not God. He didn't go anywhere. He loves you too much to do that. Boom, with that small, still voice, he said, open your eyes. That's the simple answer. And one I simply said to him, I said, I have my eyes open. He said, no, son, no, you don't. You're not focused. You are not focused, and you need to be. So all there, there, although there are many other things than, than the three that I'm going to talk about in this season, there are reasons why we, we grow weary. There are many reasons why we can't see in the waiting, why, why we grow weary and we're not strong. I want to focus on three that he really showed me with clarity. Three different things that keep us from seeing all the little miracles in a big war. Because a, a big war is made up of multiple little battles. Let's put it that way. And sometimes we fight these little bitty battles and we win all these little bitty battles, but we don't give God honor or credit for these little bitty victories. Right? This is what God showed me for myself, and I'm going to share it with you as it pertains to those things. First, he said, we're distracted by everything swarming around us. And we can't clearly see the God beside us. He's the God that is in you walking beside you. He goes before you and he comes behind you. That's what the Bible says. He is the omnipresent God who has everything for you. And the reason you can't see and the reason you can't see all the little victories in the big war sometimes falls down to these three reasons. The first one is we're distracted. And when I ask God, what are you talking about? This is what he showed me. He showed me being swarmed by a bunch of bees. In my mind's eye, I picture things. And so have you ever seen a show where people are like bees, 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 bees? We watched a kid show the other day, and there weren't really bees, but they acted like it to get people upset. And everybody got scared. Uh, who was it? Dumb and Dumber? They jump out of the car, they jump out, and they act like there's bees, and so the cop just goes away. The first reason that we can't see the little victories along the journey in this major war is because we're distracted by all the bees, and we're hitting, and we're swatting, and we're focusing on all these little things that really don't matter, that exhaust us so much that we can't see the can of bug spray that could kill them that's right next to us. We're busy waving our hands and then we're so tired that we don't even have the strength to pick it up and fight any longer. That's why we can't see the little miracles along the way. We're too busy with all the busyness. <laughs> Listen, focus is what he said, correct? That's why the scripture says in Hebrews 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses in this life, and I, when I read this, I pictured a bunch of people and witnesses, both good and bad, some of them that consume your time and don't want you to see the good in life. How many of you guys know haters and misery loves company? And so there are a lot of people who don't follow you because they want to follow you. They follow you because they're against you. And so we're so busy worrying about all these things that we're swatting at, all the things that don't matter. And we just don't cling on to Jesus and focus on what really matters. And the Word of God says right here, the reason you probably can't see all these things is because we're not doing something that we need to do to maintain our focus. Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses in this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. So right now we're talking about two categories of things. There's some things that we do that are not sin but they're slowing us down and we're exhausting ourselves and our energy on those things when God wants us to use that energy to focus on him so that we see him in every act of life in every area of life in every season of life and then there's those things that are sin that he says listen and those things that are sins come on put that behind you you are free remember what you you came from so he says, listen, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily ties us up. Now watch this. And let us run with endurance this race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Jesus is not going to be found in the people that are bugging you and the little gnats and the wasps that are flying around you, irritating the crap out of you. Don't worry about them. Jesus is what we need to focus on so that we see him in every act and every battle and every victory and any of every loss. If we lose, we just say, God, I, I don't know why I lost one, but it wasn't your will. We're going to go on to the next one. Jesus, show me some more of what you have for my life. We've lost our focus. Because of their joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. That's a powerful statement. And now he's seated at the place of honor beside, beside God's throne. Now watch this. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. If we get so busy that we're busy swatting and worrying about everything else going around us, we exhaust ourselves and we no longer have energy to focus on Jesus who's already given us an out. Who's already given us victory. Who already has made a way. 
And it's very clear that if we would just focus on him and what he's done for us and all he has given us and all he has been for us and who we accepted as both our Lord and our Savior, then, then we wouldn't be weary and give up, it says. There's a reason you're tired, weary, and given up because the battles are overwhelming you. You can't see Jesus in them. It's because you're not looking in the right direction because I guarantee you that you will see Jesus if you look hard enough. He's not hiding from you. He's not playing peekaboo. God doesn't play with our brain. He loves us too much. Oh, we're so busy swinging, we, we can't see the answer right there. That's the first reason. First reason you can't see, and I can't see sometimes, that we're just too distracted. We need to get alone with God. And see, when I, when I couldn't get alone with God last night because of the cussing of the neighbors and the, the gunshots and all that, my mind, I mean, my gut dropped, and I'm sitting here, I got to put this all back on paper because I erased my sermon. I simply had to find a new way to do it, and that's, I went upstairs and I meditated on the Lord. I laid by my wife in bed and I meditated on the Lord while she snored. There's always a way to see God in all things if you would challenge yourself to just keep plugging in. Focus on Jesus. The second thing he said that is a reason we don't see all the little victories is because we're so focused on the blessings of God that we, we forget to appreciate the God of the blessing. Now hear me in this. Some of you are not going to all like what I have to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I love you. Heh. <laughs> We're so focused on the blessings of God that we stop appreciating the God of the blessings. This is why God commands his church to do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26 says, For I pass on to you what I have received from the Lord himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. I pass on to you what I have received from the Lord myself. On the night that he was betrayed. Think about this for a minute. On the night that they betrayed Jesus and stabbed him in the back a million times over and broke his heart, when all he did was love them through the journey that they were living with him, on that day the Lord took up some bread and he gave thanks to the God, to God for it. And then he, he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given to you. Watch this. Do this in remembrance of me. We got to remember why we're serving God and who God is before we even think about the blessing that came from God. We're glad for that. We appreciate that. But our focus has to be on the God of the blessings. That's why he gives us these standards. And this, this isn't a suggestion. This is a, a command. He says, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of water, uh, of, of, of wine after supper, saying, sorry, water, saying, um, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink. For every time you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You're simply saying, God, I remember what you did right there, and I'll never forget because that's going to be my focus. Not that I'm going to have eternal life only, but that you did that for me. And when I think about those things and the God of the blessings, I get more excited about living for him rather than allowing things to kill my spiritual growth. The reason you can't see God in something is first, you're not focusing on the right things. And second, because you've made the blessing something it wasn't designed to be. You made the blessing the one thing that you think of above and beyond the God of the blessing. We've got to get back to him. He wouldn't direct us to do these things in remembrance of him if he didn't really, if, if he, I mean, he knew we would need some direction. That's why he says this. We must learn to remember the good and the great thing called salvation that comes from God too. And what it costed. Friends, we've forgotten the cross. We've forgotten the sacrifice. And sometimes when we don't put that in the forefront of our mind, we make the blessing more important. Matter of fact, sometimes we make the blessing our God. Our idol. Can I say that? Jobs, sports, money, ministry. Even kids sometimes replace the one who gave these blessings to us because our eyes are not on Jesus. And so we make the blessing more important than the God of the blessing. And I want you to know something. That's not how God designed this. He wants to bless you so that you go out, you accept it, you enjoy it, you appreciate it, you're good stewards with it, you use it for his glory, and then he blesses you some more. And it's that same rotation of life that brings out the best in all that we can do. And the glory all goes to God. Amen? I wrote this. They all become something to us when God is the God of the blessings is more important. It's time to make the activities for God number one again so that we recognize every little answer prayer. See, so we don't wither away into a category that so many fall in. They fall into this weak and, and weary. I'm so tired and I just can't hold myself together mentality. We all do it. We all do, even me. Because we've forgotten the God of the blessing. We can't do that. That's why you can't see him because he's not quite on the top of your list anymore. We must put these idols in front of... <laughs> in, 
Lord, help me say it right. Put these idols in front of praising together. Some, uh, some have put these idols in front of praising together. Idols like their kids, their work, their all kinds. You know that people even make ministry their idol? I know that sounds weird. But they will literally put ministry above everything else. And that becomes their idol. And they forget the God that gave them that ministry. Didn't give it to them. It belongs to him. He simply said, you steward, you manage this. And they, I, listen, I grew up with that. They forget that it's God, family, then church. Then friends. We've got to remember the order of things. But my point is, when we remember God first in all things, we don't forget God or we're, we're, we're more apt to see God in all these little victories, no matter what the world looks like around us. Because our eyes are on Him. We haven't made other things our idols. I wrote this. Let me just, I said, so we don't, we don't wither away. How many of you guys know that it's, it's important that we get a handle on this thing that exhausts us, uh, everything that would exhaust us and keep us from seeing Jesus? We've got to get a handle on that and put it under the blood so that our eyes remain focused I wrote this. I said, uh, we put these idols in front of praising together. We put these idols in front of Bible study together. And we do less and less and less in the church together. And then we find ourselves uh, less committed, not just to church and to things that help us to focus on what matters and keep God on the top of the list. But we find ourselves also less committed to our personal prayer life, our personal studies, our personal time with God. And slowly but surely, we begin to fade away. And we wonder why we don't see God in everything. Is because you haven't put God first in your mind to start every day. That's why you can't see God sometimes. Not everybody. These are just a few that he was showing me for me. I hope that it blesses you that I'm sharing some of this vulnerably. But um, I'm learning that God has a reason. He has a reason for everything that we're going to go through and everything that's allowed in our life. And just like Job, in the end, we will see that reason come into fruition. It's the truth. I wrote this. I said, uh, this is why I beg people to be in church. This is why I beg people to open their Bible and pray at home. This is why I beg couples to pray with each other instead of cussing each other. This is why I beg people to seek God and come together and be faithful in the things that keep them accountable. It helps so we don't see and find ourselves so tired and exhausted that we say, God, I can't see. I just can't see the many little answered prayers while I'm facing this storm I'm in. I don't want to have that mindset. I don't want to yell out and cry out to God, I can't see you, because I'm the one that began to negate the commitment level that he has required of me in my life. I can't blame God when it's me, amen? Truth is, we've gradually grown cold and less, 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 and less more and less sensitive of the Holy Spirit's guiding when we do this. And it leads to the final thing, which I, I believe leads us to be exhausted and unable to see the storms in life while we're in the waiting. The third thing he showed me, the final thing, there are many others, but these are the three that he pinpointed. One, we have to focus on Jesus, right? Two, we've we got to focus on the God of the blessings. Three, now that we've got our blessings, our miracle, many, many forget to praise God because it wasn't what they thought it was going to look like. I mean, you beg God for an answered prayer. Matter of fact, you, you were desperate, all of us. We see ourselves saying, God, we need this in our life. We need this in their life. We, we seek God, and he begins to answer these prayers. We got our blessing or our miracle, and now it's more than we could have possibly imagined. So, so he answered, and we now resent that very blessing we ask God for. And once you begin to resent the God who gave you the blessing because the blessing was more than you thought it was going to be, you immediately begin to isolate yourself and separate yourself in sin from God. You think I'm crazy? I already read it in Job. The truth is we quit praising him before our breakthroughs. Some quit praising God at all. They quit giving, they quit caring, and they blame God. And please hear me. When hell has stolen everything from Job, when, when all he ever cared for was taken, when the season was traumatic, and he had every right to blame God, he chose to praise God instead. Listen, I know that some of you got more than you thought you were going to get. But it was an answered prayer. Don't blame God because you can't handle and manage the new thing in life. Embrace it and say, God, give me more guidance and leaders. Holy Spirit, take me. Holy Spirit, guide me and lead me. That's what he wants to do. He literally died so that his spirit could reign in you and lead you through those dry seasons. So that you could see Jesus and everything. You could accept his guidance and his counsel and his power to live life. Amen? Story of this. I know a person who manipulated their way into a relationship. Five years. This person would have nothing to do with them. Then occasionally they would get together and then they would break up because the fellow was like, I don't want nothing to do with this. This is very manipulative, very hard, very hard to deal with. 
five years. But this person wanted that item so much, that blessing, that one day they manipulated and they got exactly what they wanted. But when they got what they wanted, the damaged, broken person that would treat them wrong, hurt them, not treat them like they should have been deserved in that relationship, they praised God for the miracle of having the relationship, even the marriage. But because they went about it all wrong and they got what they wanted, it became more than they could handle and they ended in divorce. You wanted that, you got it, but when you got it, you didn't realize what you were asking for was not God's will. So then you blame God. That happens all the time, bringing people out of a place where they can actually see and sense and feel the Holy Spirit. And then they blame God and God's like, I didn't do that. You manipulated the situation. You got that. Now grow from it. It's not just negative. Sometimes we get the blessing and it's huge, but it was so much more than we could tackle. And God is simply saying, hey, don't blame me for a bad thing. I blessed you with a good thing. So let me help you. God wants to help us, right? This is what it says in Job chapter 1, verse 20, 22. It said, Job stood up when he got more than he could handle out of the deal. When he got more than he could even imagine, I mean great sorrow, grief. He stood up when he was given all this bad news, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and it said he worshipped. He fell on the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from the womb, from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I go out. The Lord gave me what I have, and the Lord has taken away. How many guys know he gives and he takes away? He gives and he takes away. And just because he took something away for now doesn't mean something better is not on the way, because usually something greater is on the way. But we need to recognize these little miracles every step of the way, because listen, every one of them will build our faith so that we can conquer in the overall war, amen? I want you to be victorious in Jesus Christ, so I want you to be able to see Jesus in all the little things, because the truth of the matter is, all these little things really aren't little. Let me just keep reading what I said. I wrote. These three mindsets are exhausting. Who would agree? It's exhausting to be so distracted and you're fighting all the distractions away and God say, just focus on me. I'll give you strength. Right? It's exhausting when we begin to play the blame game because then we begin to focus on things that don't matter. It's nobody's fault. Just focus on Jesus and let him. Forget about finding fault. Can we just stop doing that for a while? It's tiring. Just own your end and take care of your side of the fence and watch God do miracles on every other side of the fence. Everyone else's yard is going to be pretty and green. Take care of your business. These three mindsets are exhausting and they gradually cause a falling away and cause us to be so cold-hearted and not, not in tune with the Holy Spirit that we don't see every little miracle. And, and he's simply saying, come back to me so I can do something great in you. So now the Holy Spirit simply says this. Open your eyes. While you're in the waiting, don't let your surroundings move you backwards and, and disable you from seeing the Spirit of God. Don't let, don't let the circumstance keep you handicapped and blinded to what Jesus really is doing just because you have to wait for a while or just because it didn't look like what you thought it was. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus in these things. Like he said, what if we just recognize all the good things he is doing? all the awesome things he is making go your way, all the beautiful blessings that you do have on the way that you're going and moving towards him. I mean, there are great things happening in some of your lives and I know you're going through hell and I know you're emotionally worn out and you're spiritually dead and I know it's tired and exhausting, but I'm telling you, if we would stop saying all that and start really looking over here to what he is doing, put it on paper, God, you've done this this year, 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 we might look back and say, it wasn't that bad after all. Glory to God in the highest would really be our praise while we're singing these songs on Christmas and we don't celebrate Christmas just to remember the big fat Santa Claus I let, let me write, 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 write. So the Holy Spirit is saying we must open our eyes these storms happen all the time they're going to happen for the rest of your life because you're Christians and people can always they can't always see God in the middle of the storm but Jesus called Peter out of the boat before Peter could see who it was all that he did was give his word and the words came forth and Peter said I want to go and he jumped out of the boat and he walked on water 
because God is the God of his words. We can't see him sometimes. I get it. Some find themselves distracted by, by the big fat guy in the red coat or a rabbit laying colorful eggs for Easter, and they forget it's, a, it's not the blessings and it's not the season. It's not the, the holiday we're celebrating. We're celebrating the God of the season, the God who did come in, a, in, in the flesh suit and live for us, right? The God that did die and rose again on Easter. We celebrate those times not to be distracted by those celebrations and those seasons, but to be aware and fully remembering. We do it to remember Jesus, just like we do with communion. Yes, yes. So we become so tired and exhausted, we blame the God who did nothing to deserve being crucified all over again by us all. When in fact, all along, he's always been there. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not there. He's always been there. He always will because you are his child. This daddy loves you. Papa, the, like Steve calls him Papa, the Bible. He's Papa. He's Abba, Father. Abba, Father, our Redeemer. We have victory, church. So I know you're tired. I know you're exhausted. But we get to end strong. We get to remember Jesus and all he has done. And we get to walk into a new season that God is promising. I can't help but get excited when God starts saying, you're going to see some victory like you've never seen before. I get pumped. I don't know what that looks like, but I know it may be a million little things, but a million little things add up to something huge. Yes, yes, yes. Because every victory is a victory. Yes. Some of us are, we woke up. I wrote this and I just got to read it like I wrote it so I don't get it all off. We can't see him, or some find themselves distracted by the fat guy in the red coat, the rabbit laying colorful eggs, or blessings that didn't turn out exactly like we expected, right? So we become so tired and exhausted, we can't see God, we blame him instead. When he did nothing to deserve being blamed, or to be, nothing to deserve being crucified all over by our lack of faith. When in fact, all along, he's been right there. Friends, God forgive us when we blame him when all he's done is love us every step of the way I want to share with you a couple things I thought were really cool videos because people need to believe I know it may not seem big when he does those little things for you but they are answered prayers so they are big we've got to start recognizing those and if you can't see them just look at your kids come on I get up and I get my grandkids at the bus stop. I get, to, I get to sit there and I mean, when I'm having a bad day for that moment, the day is awesome. Yeah. Even when they pee their pants and pick their nose and all those weird things. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I see Jesus in them. Or last night when I saw my son and my daughter-in-law and just enjoying, they said, oh, dad, we just loved all the laughter in our house tonight. And in me, I began to see Jesus in the situation because listen, when we get in tune with the Holy Spirit, we begin to see things differently. And when we begin to stop doing the things that created the disciplines and the things that really grew us in Christ, the less we have of Him, the less we notice Him. It's like everything else in life. That's my whole point. If we summed up the whole thing, the reason we don't see Him is we've got to get back to the point where we are so connected personally and intimately in our relationship with God that we see Him in everything we touch. And I know it's hard. And I know we've had one heck of a year. I'm going to go, one hell of a year. I don't mean that to be coarse or crude. It's literally been hell for some of you. But the God that I serve wants to make something beautiful out of that chaos. We just got to look to him in it. I want to show you two things that are huge things. They're videos. One's kind of a promotion for a Christian network, but I don't care. The miracle's great in it. If you can get past that. And then another one that just stirred my heart. Would you play that? What's my point? What's my point, friends? These miracles are so that we remember the God of the season. Yes, we should value the blessings. Yes, we should remember the purpose of every blessing. But these things are, are always meant to keep us focused on the God of the season and the blessings. They're meant to grow us and strengthen us so that we can go out and do more and, and see more and be in tune with all the little miracles that he is doing. Friends, I know it's hard, but remember every miracle should carry us from one to the next and to the next. God, forgive us. Open our eyes while we are in the waiting. We want to see you. We want to know you, Lord. We want every miracle to, to be seen not as small or large miracles, but all of them as undeserved gifts from Jesus himself, whose blood paved the way for our victory. Victory, victory. 
I don't want to see a small miracle. I don't want to see a large. I want to see Jesus in every miracle. When it happens, Jesus did that. Like, like somebody said they're going to pay for the rest of my dentures. Jesus did that. Somebody blessed us financially. Jesus did that. Somebody, somebody prayed for you. Somebody showed up. You got a job. Jesus did that. You're not dead and you should be because you've been an alcoholic or an addict for all of your life. And, and for me, every time that I went and I, I decided I was going to try an OD, I never did because God saw fit to save me from me. Jesus did that. Don't forget the miracles are so that Jesus can be seen and glory be given to God for those who are watching. Yeah, I get excited. We want every miracle to be seen not as small or large miracles, but as undeserved gifts in the season of giving from Jesus himself, whose blood paved the way for our victory. Who remembers that song of victory in Jesus? Take this out. I'm going to give you a shot. He goes, I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. Turn that off for me, buddy. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wrench like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Here's that song goes. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me there, I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He goes on, he goes, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. Then I obeyed his blessed command and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. Oh, some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. (laughs) Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Come on, can you give him a hand, guys? He's a good God. Stand with me, would you? Let me remind you all, Job didn't get back up and didn't fall over and lose everything. He was blessed over a hundredfold for his pain and his trauma. He was given more than he could have ever imagined because he made it. He went through it. He faced it. And he, and he just survived by giving God honor and praising him before the miracle while in the waiting. We can take that example and live it. Don't give up. Keep seeking God. Focus on what matters, church, because there's something good in And it's on the way. And I believe he's, he's already started putting it together. Amen? Amen. And, I, and so I go out saying this. The Bible says, he says this. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. The plans are for the good, for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. (laughs) If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I've sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. God wants to do something beautiful. 
So let's start really looking. Let's get back focused on what matters and not, not distracted by all the crazy distractions like flies on a, on a hot summer day when you're eating watermelon. Don't worry about it. You focus on the watermelon. Well, focus on Jesus. Because he's got something special for you, church. He's putting something together and he's trying to get us to get closer together for this. But it's going to depend on this body and their, and their longevity, their faithfulness. 